Welcome to Trial Site News Podcast Series. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Richard Fury here to discuss his recent involvement in the Phase 3 Bliss LN clinical trial that is setting the stage for the first ever FDA approved drug for lupus nephritis. Now, Dr. Fury is a professor at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research, Northwell Health Science Arm of the Health. System. Regarded as one of the senior rheumatologists in the New York metropolitan area, he has been on the board of directors for the, of, uh, for the, or of the local chapters of the Arthritis Foundation and the Lupus Alliance of America and has been a member of the Medical Scientific Advisory Council of the Lupus Foundation of America as well as its Lupus News Editorial Board. So, Dr. Fury, welcome. Thank you. Now, to get our audience up to speed, and for those who may not be aware of what it is, can you share with the audience the current situation with lupus nephritis? What is it, and what is the impact on patients, and why there are no approved treatments to date? Sure. So lupus nephritis is the most common severe manifestation of lupus. Inflammation in the kidney leads to damage, and damage begets more damage. And when there's excessive amounts of damage or scar formation, the kidney is no longer able to effectively do its job, which is to cleanse the blood and excrete waste products. And if the kidneys fail, the body's waste products would then need to be removed by some other means, namely dialysis, or for those fortunate patients who can get a kidney transplant, that's a wonderful procedure. So kidney failure is also associated with many comorbidities, such as hypertension, vascular disease, infection, bone problems, and I could go on and on. Now, the reasons for no approved treatments, we can tackle that when we discuss the standard of care treatments. Sounds like a plan. So what is the standard of care then for the disease currently? Well, a bit of history. So if we go back long before you were born, but right around when I was born, the outlook for a patient with lupus around World War II or just a little bit after that was actually terrible. 50% survival at seven years. And that was owing largely to kidney involvement as there was no effective therapy for kidney disease. We didn't have dialysis back then and of course did not have transplant. But along came steroids in 1948 and then immunosuppressives and chemotherapy a bit later on. Dialysis and kidney transplant, as I mentioned, contributed to better outcomes in later decades. So the drug that became sort of the gold standard in the 1980s, 1990s was intravenous cyclophosphamide, a chemotherapy. And this treatment was pioneered by the NIH and it it became the standard therapy for patients with lupus nephritis. Now, subsequently, mycophenolate was introduced and it basically was equivalent to cyclophosphamide but viewed to be much safer. Both mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide have remained our go-to regimens to this day. Complete response rates achieved with these drugs, unfortunately, is only about 30%. So that's just too low a number. And we know that those who do best long-term are those who achieve a complete response within the first year of treatment. In fact, I mean, I hate to say it, but about 40% of our patients with diffuse proliferative nephritis which is a common subset of lupus nephritis, go on to kidney failure over the course of 15 years. So we definitely need to do better with our standard of care therapies, which are actually not approved by the regulatory authorities, but they are our standard of care therapies. They are the best drugs to treat lupus nephritis. But the bottom line, I mean, the message is we need to do a better job in lupus nephritis. Now, can you give the audience some background on the investigational drug that you've been working on, known as belumumab? Sure. Also, a little bit of background about the immune system in lupus. In lupus, the immune system goes a bit haywire and starts attacking the body. Any organ can be attacked, although the most common ones include the skin, the joints, and the kidneys. The ideal treatment for a patient would be one that is effective, and does not cause side effects. So to achieve this goal, we need a highly targeted approach. And one of the major culprits in lupus is the B cell, which is a white blood cell that participates in causing inflammation. Now, B cells are dependent upon particular factors for their survival and growth. And one such factor is known as BLIS, B 
B-L-Y-S, B lymphocyte stimulator, but it's also referred to as BAF. And belimumab is a therapeutic antibody that was developed in the late 1990s. It binds to this protein, it binds to bliss, and reduces the levels in the body. And this is basically a way of starving the B cells for their essential growth factors, and it lessens their abilities to attack the body. Belimumab studies started around the year 2000 and culminated in FDA approval in lupus in 2011. However, the studies that we did, the phase three program, did not include patients with severely active lupus nephritis. The first use of belimumab was intended for patients with extra renal disease, you know, like arthritis and rash. The Bliss LN study was performed to determine the drug's effectiveness in patients that were excluded in the phase three program, that is those who have severely active lupus nephritis, and we also had data suggesting that it might be effective in lupus nephritis that was generated post hoc from that phase three program. And we also had translational data that supported this approach to study active lupus nephritis. Now, could you, could you expand a little bit more on the Bliss LN study? Can you summarize the findings of it and the implications for patients that are struggling with lupus nephritis? I can, but first let me just preface this. We have struggled so much in lupus clinical trials, both in lupus nephritis and extra renal lupus. We've had one drug approved and that's belimumab by the route of a randomized controlled trial. And it's not for lack of trying. So the Bliss LN study was the largest lupus nephritis study ever conducted. And the design was such that belimumab was added to standard of care treatment, and that could be mycophenolate, as I mentioned, and a unique feature of this study was that it could be added to background cyclophosphamide, so investigators had a choice. And the study duration was two years, which is also somewhat unique because most studies end at one year. The primary endpoint was known as PER, P-E-R-R, -R, primary endpoint of renal response, and that was successfully achieved, as were all the secondary endpoints. Now, the differences between treatment and placebo were around 11 percentage points for the various endpoints. And all of the endpoints achieved statistical differences. Now, it's important to note that when we say placebo, it's not just placebo. It's placebo on top of standard of care. So no patient entering these studies is deprived of standard of care. And again, standard of care was mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. Now, there was one particular endpoint that evaluated the drug's ability to prevent worsening. And that's the name of the game for long-term treatment of lupus nephritis. I mean, the ideal study for lupus nephritis would be about 40 or 50 years long, but obviously that's not practical. But there was an endpoint, time to a renal-related event, which is basically a proxy for worsening or for flaring. And in this study, 50% fewer patients in the blimumab group had a flare over the two years of the study. Oh, wow. So that's why I say it would be great to be able to carry out a study for 20, 30 years, but you just can't have a placebo controlled trial go that long. So for patients without kidney involvement, blimumab has been available for 10 years. But for those with kidney disease, we obviously need to wait the decision by the FDA. So patients, meanwhile, should have discussions with their doctors to learn about some of these drugs that are in development for lupus. Now, what challenges did you run into in this study? And if possible, could you describe how you overcame them? Sure. Um, I mean, all lupus studies are challenging. Recruitment is one of the biggest issues. Not everybody qualifies for a study, and then unfortunately, there's often resistance by patients to participate in trials for a lot of different reasons. But the bottom line is we can't have new drugs unless patients participate. And then once a patient agrees, it's often challenging to keep them in the study, especially this one, which went a full two years. It really is a large commitment to participate. Now, you mentioned some of the positives, like the 50% reduction. Were there any other promising signals from the clinical trial results? 
Well, I spoke, I mean, I didn't go into detail about the main results, but the primary was successful and all the key secondaries. So we showed an effect, not just at two years, but actually showed effects much earlier on, like at week 24. So that's a positive that we can see an effect with this drug earlier than say the two year endpoint. But I really am most intrigued about this time to renal related event, because I do think that's a proxy for flaring and flaring brings on damage and damage accrual leads to kidney failure. Now, as far as the trajectory for FDA approval for belumumab, do you have any estimates of a timeline? I actually don't know. I mean, hopefully maybe by the new year, it would be a good holiday present for sure. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, are, is there anything else that you're working on? Any other clinical trials? Uh, we have a whole portfolio of lupus and lupus nephritis trials. Until we can safely put someone into remission, we have work to do. Our clinical trial model has been applied to other rheumatic diseases, you know, with our within our own division. And we've witnessed enormous progress in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, but there are additional frontiers. I'd include lupus, we have a ways to go, scleroderma, myositis, osteoarthritis, for example. But we are making progress. I mean, some of these uh, medicines for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis have really been transformative, and that's what we want to take to these other conditions as well. And before I let you go today, um, if you would, I'd like you to, to share some positive attributes about Northwell and Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research. Uh, if, if you could talk about why this health system and research center are it's important for sponsors to consider for research studies, um, we'd love to hear from you on that. Sure, I actually came to this institution in 1985. Oh, I can't believe it's that long ago. <laughs> Uh, when research and the clinical programs like ours were just starting. But the growth of our health system has been amazing. And one of the byproducts of this growth has been the ability to create large cohorts of patients that can potentially engage in research. Our lupus program receives more invitations now to participate in various research studies than we can really support. But the bottom line is that research will reward the patients, outcomes will improve, and the future will be brighter for all. So I thank you for letting me speak. Yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure to have you. And Dr. Fury, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today.